Welcome back to the uh, Gora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. Uh, today, I'm very happy to have joining us uh, my friend Gary Chartier, uh, who is Distinguished Professor of Law and Business Ethics and Associate Dean of the Tom and Vi Zapara School of Business at La Sierra University, Senior Fellow at the Center for a Stateless Society, Member of the Board of Directors of the Molinari Institute, he has a JD from UCLA, a PhD and LLD from Cambridge University, uh, in addition to over 40 articles in such venues as Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, Legal Theory, Law and Philosophy, and Religious Studies. He's also authored with Cambridge University Press four books, Anarchy and Legal Order, Law and Politics for Stateless Society, Economic Justice and Natural Law, Flourishing Lives, Exploring Natural Law Liberalism, and Public Practice, Private Law, an Essay on Love, Marriage, and the State. With Paul Grave Macmillan, he's authored two books, An Ecological Theory of Free Expression and Radicalizing Roles, Global Justice and the Foundations of International Law. With Griffin and Lash, he has The Analogy of Love, Divine and Human Love at the Center of Christian Theology, Vulnerability and Community, Meditations on the Spiritual Life, and The Idea of an Adventist University. From other publishers, he has The Logic of Commitment with Routledge, a Good Life in the Market, An Introduction to Business Ethics with the American Institute for Economic Research, In the Open Hand, Sonnets from the Californian from Steepletop Press, The Conscience of an Anarchist, Why It's Time to Say Goodbye to the State and Build a Free Society with Cobden Press. He, uh, he has co-authored Crushing the Begging Bowl, How Entrepreneurial Nonprofits Can Empower Themselves and Their Customers. It's published with Griffin and Lash. And he's edited the Future of Adventism, Theology, Society, Experience with Griffin and Lash. Uh, and uh, he has co-edited the volumes Markets Not Capitalism, Individualist Anarchism Against Bosses, Inequality, Corporate Power, and Structural Poverty, published minor compositions, Social Class and State Power, Exploring Al an Alternative Radical Tradition, published with Paul Grave Macmillan, and the Routledge Handbook of Anarchy and Anarchist Thought, forthcoming from, you guessed it, Routledge. And in the interest of full disclosure, I was a I, I was a co-editor on one of those and a contributor to uh, all three. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for now, but thanks for coming on, Gary, and I hope to see you another time. Very well. Yeah. All right. Actually, I think maybe we have a little bit more time. So um, uh, I thought this would just be a... Uh, uh, a chance for uh, you to uh, tell my uh, tell uh, my viewers a little bit about your background, your history, how you got very interested. I mean, you you have a lot of broad, obviously, a broad range of interests: uh, philosophy, theology, uh, law, literature, business, and a lot of my viewers probably know you best for your work in you know, uh, left wing market anarchism. Um, so, your background, uh, your career, how you got interested in some of the various things that you're interested in. Well, feel free to interrupt at any point with the more specific questions, but I guess broadly I would say- What is your social security number? <laughs> I'll uh, Careful what you ask for. Private message. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm a native Californian. Uh, I was born in Glendale, which for people who don't know California is kind of broadly in the LA suburbs. And apart from a brief stint in North Carolina for about three years when I was a pretty tiny person, and about six months in uh, the Napa Valley when I was a little older, and time that I spent in graduate school in England, I've lived in Southern California my whole life. Um, my parents uh, were, uh, were migrants uh, to the region, my uh, mom, uh, up in Florida, my dad in New England. Uh, they met in college there, uh, and after a stint in, in Texas, uh, found their way uh, found their way out to California in the mid 1950s, uh, where my dad, uh, uh, en route to medical school, having first been an accountant, uh, actually taught for a year uh, in the business department and also 
slightly the history department uh, at what's now La Sierra University where I teach. Um, I think I have uh, had the uh, profile of a lot of developing libertarians of my generation, which is to say that I, um, I had Goldwater-eyed parents, I programmed computers, I read science fiction, and I was socially awkward. And uh, I, uh, uh, you know, sort of radicalized uh, myself, uh, having, you know, probably initially picked up fairly unthinkingly my, my parents' political views. Uh, I began to read uh, in, uh, in political theory uh, early on, uh, probably in, well, I started thinking about, about constitutions and uh, embracing the very un, uh, unlibertarian and certainly unanarchist view that I should be, uh, should be emperor and uh, trying, you know, as a junior high student to think about what a constitution uh, that, uh, you know, prepared me, you know, that provided the right sort of institutional environment for my imperial uh, might look like. I suppose that's probably what got me thinking in more abstract terms about, uh, uh, about political theory uh, early on read Hayek and Nozick and Rothbard. Uh, I suppose the first substantial political theory book I remember diving into was, was probably Hayek's The Mirage of Social Justice. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I was uh, following a pretty conventional path in that respect uh, toward libertarian adulthood. Uh, I got distracted as a university student, uh, drawn down the uh, the alternate path of what was in many respects a, a fairly sort of conventional social democratic uh, position. Uh, and then as I like to say, uh, George Bush and Barack Obama brought me back to uh, anarchism and libertarianism uh, by their uh, abysmal abysmal behavior in the early 2000s, which really returned me to, uh, to thinking about such matters. I, I suppose I'd been reflecting on related things for a while, had certainly been aware of difficulties with um, uh, arguments for state authority and, and so forth. I, I really enjoyed, uh, uh, you know, as a graduate student and later becoming acquainted with the work of the, as it seems to me, underappreciated uh, uh, English libertarian philosopher Stephen Clark, who uh, had done quite a good job of demolishing uh, arguments for state authority when I when I read him, uh, but uh, wasn't really focused on such matters until uh, again I was sort of sort of re-radicalized uh, in the early two thousands, and uh, when I was, uh, I was fortunate that I had access, uh, as I really didn't uh, back in the eighties, uh, to the work of people who could make clear their responsiveness to the uh, left-wing sensibilities that uh, I had uh, embraced and also to uh, uh, very attractive uh, pro-market and uh, anti-state views. And I speak here, of course, of people like uh, Roderick Long and Sheldon Richman and Kevin Carson and Charles Johnson, uh, who, uh, you know, really played an important role. In, in helping me think through a whole range of things. So uh, uh, that's where I started. That's where I, where I am now. Maybe there were other things you were interested in, and if so, I'm happy to, to talk about those. Well, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your philosophical approach to uh, left-wing market anarchism? Sure. Uh, so, you know, broadly speaking, in moral and political philosophy, I live in the... Uh, the Anglo-American analytic world. And, uh, you know, I've learned from a whole range of people, but for the last, uh, you know, uh, I suppose dozen years or so, I focused my attention on the uh, so-called new natural law, or new classical natural law approach uh, to ethics, law, and politics. Uh, I've been aware of and appreciative of uh, this uh, this approach for for much longer, but I really uh, uh, became a sort of out uh, enthusiast, uh, I suppose, in you know 2009. Um, broadly speaking, uh, this is a view in the Aristotelian Thomas tradition. Uh, so it takes uh, flourishing and fulfillment as uh, central uh, moral categories. 
I suppose where it differs from, you know, a lot of standard uh, Aristotelian views and indeed from, from some Thomist views is in its incorporation of deontological principles uh, in its account of uh, uh, what it is to, to seek flourishing. And uh, uh, so, of course, it doesn't treat those as alien constraints, but precisely as, uh, uh, as ways of, uh, of reasoning about a, about a flourishing life, about a good life. And uh, so this is an approach which I think is much richer than uh, more, uh, perhaps to some people, more familiar Kantian and utilitarian approaches, uh, which can often be seen as inattentive to the uh, rich array of, uh, of human goods and as uh, concerned more to adjudicate relationships among otherwise detached persons rather than to offer an account of what it is for the agent uh, to live well. And so I certainly think that uh, uh, the interpersonal dimension of ethics and law and politics uh, is really important. But I also think that what really ought to be foundational is the question, what does a good life look like? Uh, and I'm very pleased that that's precisely where the, uh, the natural law approach that I favor uh, begins. Now, for a lot of people, both the natural law approach and the libertarian approach tend to be at odds with left-wing values. So how do you see those three things as fitting together? Yeah. So natural law theory is very often um, linked with a kind of social conservatism. And I suppose that's true both because uh, natural law theory is itself taken to imply substantive moral views uh, that are uh, that are socially conservative and also because natural law theory is seen to provide um, license for state action in pursuit of socially conservative views and indeed active encouragement uh, for for state action in pursuit of socially conservative views so um, you know, I think my own uh, approach has, first of all, drawn on um, aspects of, well, it has offered an account of natural law theory. Let's, let's put it this way. My own preferred account of natural law theory um, has in various ways underscored limits on uh, state power and on the use of force more generally to uh, get people to behave in particular ways. Um, I've argued for a more robust conception of property rights, uh, for instance, than I think uh, uh, has often been defended in, in natural law circles. Uh, I've argued against the um, use of uh, state power uh, to interfere with people's personal moral choices, often precisely on, on the grounds of, of these robust property rights. And also, I think, uh, you know, in a variety of other, I hope, complementary ways, uh, pointing out the degree to which interference with uh, uh, people's uh, moral choices can be an attack on the uh, basic good of practical reasonableness. Uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, and it's worth pointing out in this regard that John Finnis, uh, one of the, the most important contemporary new natural law uh, theorists, uh, has said uh, that he thinks Aquinas's view, which I take him largely to endorse, uh, is pretty indistinguishable from, Mill, you know, from Mill's view in terms of what the, the state ought to be doing. Now, uh, so it's not necessarily the case that natural law theorists are all interested in, uh, in a busybody state. But then at the, at the individual level, um, I've also uh, argued against the substantive ethical views that have tended to um, form the heart of the social conservatism of natural law theory, uh, to try to show that reasonable adjustments to the theory uh, including, for instance, recognizing the inherent uh, value 
of sensory pleasure, uh, things like that, uh, can help us to rethink the theory itself so that, for instance, views in opposition to, uh, say, for instance, uh, same-sex sexual and romantic relationships, uh, that opposition is is no longer defensible in terms of the theory, and that's that's a big part of what I try to argue for in uh, public practice, private law. Um, in general, I think the principle of fairness, uh, the golden rule, which does play an important part in natural law theorizing, uh, yields more egalitarian uh, consequences, I think, uh, and more uh, kind of individualist consequences than perhaps. Uh, uh, all the natural law theorists uh, necessarily suppose. And uh, that I think has consequences, not just say, for instance, uh, for, for something like, uh, like sexual ethics, where we need a whole range of, of other uh, tweaks to the theory to uh, uh, get us to a more socially liberal position. But then also with respect to a range of uh, uh, issues, uh, say, related to the workplace, uh, where I think uh, uh, taking uh, the principle of fairness seriously certainly at least creates uh, some some kind of presumption against uh, you know the exercise of arbitrary authority and so forth in the workplace, um, and uh, certainly makes it attractive to move toward flat, decentralized, and uh, uh, you know small uh, firms uh, related by contract rather than uh, large. Uh, Indeed, the enormous corporate behemoths that uh, often are, are impersonal and, uh, and arbitrary in the way they're managed. If we affirm on natural law grounds uh, the kinds of robust property rights that I think we should, then, of course, affirming those robust property rights leads to the conclusion that various sorts of state interference, uh, as I've already noted, uh, with economic life will be unjustified, but that in turn also means a whole range of props to the uh, positions of the wealthy and well-connected, uh, props uh, to existing uh, corporate hierarchies and so forth. All of these will be illegitimate. And uh, so we get uh, certainly uh, left-wing positions regarding uh, uh, these aspects of <laughs> positions marked by opposition to uh, uh, oppressive uh, corporate hierarchies and uh, arbitrary authority in the workplace. Uh, I think, you know, on, a, on the basis of a combination of the concern with fairness and uh, the background, background property rights, which uh, at least create space for alternatives and undermine support for these uh, uh, kind of authoritarian workplace uh, features. And of course, I don't want to suggest that left-wing positions are somehow limited to uh, uh, the workplace, limited to uh, economic life. I also just think the basic principles of fairness undercut, uh, uh, obviously, hierarchies with respect uh, to gender and uh, race and so forth as well. So roughly speaking, I guess that's how I would get at things. Now, a lot of my uh, viewers are involved in academia either as students or as professors or sometimes students on their way to becoming professors and you've heard some interesting and provocative things about the ethics of uh, grading. Uh, yeah, I think that some of my students would be delighted at some of your suggestions such as the, the uh, uh, that it uh, is not ethically proper to penalize people for non-attendance for example. They might be dismayed at some of your other suggestions such as that uh, extra credit is uh, also not really proper. Um, so can you say a little bit about some of your views about the ethics of grading? Sure. Uh, I think you may be the only person who's ever asked me to talk about that in an interview. Uh, and uh, three cheers for you. Um, so what I want to suggest uh, with respect to grading is that um, Grades are first and foremost communicative. Uh, the function of a grade, it seems to me, is to provide folks I call transcript readers uh, with useful information about what students can be expected to do, what, what, what their capacities are. And so who are transcript readers? Well, pretty obviously they're employers who look at transcripts. Don't know how many really do that. And also, uh, 
educational institutions, uh, typically ones to which somebody might uh, transfer uh, in the course of an undergrad experience or uh, to which somebody might apply uh, at the graduate level after completing an undergraduate experience. And so uh, grades need to be framed with an eye to their role in uh, informing uh, transcript readers. And so what I want to suggest, uh, first of all, is that if I provide a, a grade that uh, uh, really doesn't seem accurate to me, and obviously I understand this, you know, tremendous uh, uh, wiggle in terms of what counts as an accurate grade, but if the grade doesn't really seem accurate to me, then first of all, um, I'm lying. And uh, while uh, in the same book in which I discuss this, uh, I talk about some contexts in which, uh, uh, or some, some reasons why on occasion lies might be appropriate, uh, I certainly think we ought to begin with a very strong presumption against lying uh, in all contexts. And uh, certainly the fact that uh, uh, inaccurate- Manuel Kant was saying the same thing to me this morning uh, before I yeah. moved with you. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, uh, he may take a slightly more rigoristic view than I do, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm just glad that the, the two of you are still on speaking terms. Anyway. Actually, we, we conducted our conversation through semaphore, but it was, his, it was his way of getting around his having vowed never to speak to me again, but he still um, had much to say. Yeah, that's right. Um, he, um, he, he can certainly be trusted to, uh, to take his vows seriously. So, yeah, so first of all, I think there's an issue of deception there, uh, of, of lying that I'm troubled by. And then I just think there's a, a problem that when things that, things that don't really have to do with the student's capabilities uh, in a given class uh, are reflected in the grade, um, there's no sort of obvious, straightforward way of combining them uh, in a way that yields some sort of intelligible result. So, you know, certainly we can decide that we're going to take uh, various uh, factors into account. Uh, we, you know, we perhaps it could just be agreed among all students, all faculty members, all transcript readers, that uh, a bunch of different factors would be taken into account in a certain way. And perhaps in that case, I mean, I'd be against doing that, but perhaps in that case, uh, you know, there wouldn't be, uh, you know, the same kind of model. But it seems as if in general, there isn't anything like that sort of agreement. Uh, the most obvious interpretation of an A in Algebra 2 is that you're a strong performer, you know, your competence is substantial with respect to the understood subject matter of Algebra 2. And so if, uh, you know, if it turns out to be the case that um, you, uh, uh, that, that that A, you know, is a reflection perhaps in part of your uh, performance uh, of your, your subject matter competence is the phrase I like to use in Algebra 2, but also perhaps uh, the fact that you brought me a birthday cake uh, and uh, also that you were just a, you know, a friendly member of the class. I think somebody who discovers that in fact, absent those extra factors, your uh, uh, grade, uh, you know, might instead be a B minus, uh, might be a little trouble to have hired you for a, a position that uh, presupposes some mathematical Competence. Uh, so I think, you know, that's partly a matter of uh, concern about lying and partly just a matter of, of concern about the um, uh, the diversity of these various factors in the, in the sense that, you know, we can get more accurate grades, we can communicate better if our grades focus on specific uh, things and why not specifically subject matter competence. So that then means I suggest that uh, you know, not only should we avoid uh, giving grades, uh, you know, as rewards for good behavior over and above, uh, uh, you know, whatever evidence we have of your competence, but also uh, that, uh, you know, we not use grades to incentivize uh, people uh, for various reasons. Uh, you know, it might seem attractive 
uh, ex ante to award, uh, uh, you know, to, to promise grades uh, based on attendance or on the completion of homework or whatever, because you want to incentivize attendance or homework completion because you think these things contribute to learning. But ex post, if you have good reason to believe that somebody's subject matter competence is substantial, even though that person hasn't, uh, uh, you know, attended uh, in a very reliable way or hasn't done the homework, then it just seems at that point ex post to be uh, uh, deceptive and otherwise problematic to, to base a grade on, uh, on that uh, uh, additional information that's really not germane to subject matter competence. So, you know, in the article that uh, you've highlighted, Roderick, I go through, go on to talk about a bunch of other instances in which uh, a lot of common practices, it seems to me, uh, can be objected to precisely on the grounds that they don't uh, uh, involve a, a focus on subject matter competence. Subject matter competence, again, I think being important uh, both because uh, of the need to avoid deception and because of the uh, muddled character of uh, grades that involved uh, uh, attention to things other than subject matter competence. That doesn't mean at all, uh, as I try to suggest, that institutions shouldn't care about other things, whether about somebody's uh, you know, behavior as a participant in class or somebody's, uh, uh, you know, apparent, uh, you know, lack of honesty or whatever. And I'm, I'd be very happy to see those things highlighted in separate uh, transcript notations where they might actually be more uh, importantly, valuably, effectively communicative than they would be uh, if just folded into grades. Uh, I just think that grades uh, themselves uh, need to be uh, need to be based on a on a fairly narrow range of, of considerations. So that's that's roughly the position yeah. I take. Oh, so so you know, maybe it would be nice if um, obviously this would require sort of institutional change more than something that would be up to an individual teacher. But uh, it'd be nice if you know, maybe each course could have two different grades: one for you know recognition of you know, accomplishment or mastery of the material, and one for you know effort or engagement or or something like that so that someone could see both of those things if they were interested in both of those. Uh, of course, when yeah. I was in grad school, we just, um, and I know some grad schools do this and some don't, but we just got satisfactory, unsatisfactory for their courses, but then the the fact, the, the teacher would write up uh, a long, well, sometimes long, sometimes not, depending on the, you know, on the, uh, the energy of the teacher, um, would, you know, would do a write-up of, uh, of um, you know, various uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses of the, uh, of the student. Uh, I remember my, my logic professor saying about me and mine that I seem to prefer uh, going through, um, uh, it's solving logic problems or going through long arguments rather than short ones. And I was thinking, I clicked the shortest one I could goddamn find. <laughs> Uh, but um, that's sort of a digression. Um, uh, by the way, is that is, is that piece of yours on grading? Is that in the business ethics book or the the, the yeah. or the um, wh which book's it in? Yeah, so it it originally appeared in the BYU Education and Law Journal, uh, but uh, the current version, the version that I'm happiest with, is. Uh, the what second or third chapter of flourishing lives exploring natural law liberalism. Okay, so it's not in it's not in the business ethics book. It's in flourishing lives. Okay, I will have links to all of your books in the uh, description for people to uh, don't seek them out. So it's uh, so if you're interested in reading more about the grading thing that's in flourishing lives, uh, there's a recent dispute and it's become sort of a. Um, uh, you know, a fairly strong nationwide dispute, um, but it's also sort of dispute sort of within left libertarian uh, uh, circles generally. Um, uh, not exactly on on free speech per se, uh, in terms of you know sort of what what government you know what kind of interference government should be allowed to make in free speech because generally the answer would be none for. For libertarians left or otherwise but questions about sort of the general culture of free speech where there's often there often seems to be a a case on both sides that on the one side um you know 
uh, when we're talking about sort of non, you know, non-aggressive, non-violent restrictions on free speech, like uh, you know, boycotting institution to get someone uh, fired for uh, um, for expressing uh, you know racist uh, or homophobic or sexist views or whatever. Um, on the one hand, uh, I'm saying this is you know this is uh, creates a chilling effect on free speech. It's the wrong way to deal with uh, free speech. And others say. Um, no, this is a way of you know, basically protecting people's, you know, protecting people from, uh, uh, from uh, being, you know, being subject to uh, sort of harmful and prejudicial uh, attitudes and influences. So, uh, and you've, you've thought a fair bit about this. So could you say a little bit about uh, your views on, on that range of topics? Yeah, sure. So the main thing I'd want to say is, as in most uh, uh, interesting conversations, it's complicated, right? So, um, so we we begin with the uh, the view that it is entirely, um, you know, within the rights of uh, uh, of those who are concerned about the content of somebody's speech to. Uh, you know, to express that concern uh, very vigorously, and uh, uh, one of, and and of course they in turn have their own uh, uh, free speech rights, uh, and those rights include uh, uh, certainly the right to say um, Auburn University should fire Roderick Long. Uh, so I begin, of course, with with that assumption. Um, my general left libertarian dismay, I think, with um, with corporate power uh, makes me not want to see uh, activists encourage um, encourage corporations uh, to use legal rights that they they might well have and that indeed they might well they might well have uh, in a uh, you know in a fully free society uh, not to use those rights uh, to um, uh, to stifle a uh, debate in most cases. And so uh, the kinds of cases that you have in mind, uh, perhaps we can, can bracket for a moment, we'll come back to those. Uh, and I, I should indeed have written more about them than I did uh, in my recent book on free speech. But I did try to say in that book how important I thought it was that uh, just as a general matter, businesses allow as much internal dialogue as possible about matters related to their uh, operations and uh, uh, as much uh, contribution by uh, uh, their workers uh, to wider public dialogue uh, as possible. That the general values, I think, that we seek to serve by protecting uh, free speech uh, are, are certainly served in this way, right? So my, my view is that a, um, a fully adequate account of uh, kind of why we care, why we should care about freedom of expression includes certainly a concern for property rights, which might be uh, infringed upon by forcible interference with, uh, uh, with expressive activity, um, but also with a concern for autonomy of speakers and the autonomy of hearers, um, also with a concern for the uh, role of speech in uh, fostering the quest for, for understanding uh, and for truth. Um, I think also with some uh, you know, some concerns about, uh, you know, in what ways speech might actually be said to, uh, to harm. And then uh, finally, with the uh, worries about the ways in which those empowered to make decisions that might, uh, in one way or another, uh, restrain speech, uh, the ways in which those decision makers uh, might find it easy to yield to temptations to promote their own uh, private agendas or those of their cronies by restricting speech. And I guess my point is that um, a number of those considerations uh, uh, very much apply to private institutions as well as to uh, ones that uh, 
you know, employ, employ force like states. Uh, and so what I want to see is uh, those institutions take seriously uh, the, uh, you know, the kinds of concerns that might underlie a free speech regime, not as a matter of uh, treating themselves as bound by, by laws, uh, which they certainly should be. Uh, they should certainly be free to act badly. And sometimes, of course, uh, you know, the absence of law gives them the freedom to, to act rightly in a way that, you know, doesn't necessarily track some very general, uh, general norm uh, in this regard. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want to see norms that in general take seriously um, uh, those, those concerns uh, that ought to underlie uh, an adequate freedom of expression regime uh, like autonomy and uh, the quest for truth and also doubts about the merits of uh, decision makers' uh, behavior. Uh, all of that, I think, uh, you know, matters in a private as much as in a public context. Uh, and I talk about it with respect to nonprofits like uh, like churches, uh, for instance, which might sometimes want to suppress uh, the speech of dissenters, as well as uh, in relation to corporations that might want, in one way or another, to avoid public embarrassment or to uh, uh, shut down internal debate of one kind or another. And you know, I can't offer some kind of general norm that is always going to apply in every case to such institutions, but I at least think there's there are fairly strong presumptions there. So, you know, you talked about um, concern particularly with uh, protection. And I think that's another matter, right, where the issue is not so much uh, a case in which, uh, you know, that it's not that the thought is not people need to be protected from speech, but rather the fact that someone has spoken in a given way gives evidence of attitudes in virtue of which it might be quite difficult for that person to adequately uh, perform duties that involve, uh, you know, treating people fairly and, uh, and so forth. And so, um, you know, that, that I think is a, is a different kind of matter. It's not a matter of somehow uh, punishing people for uh, the content of their speech. It's using the content of their speech as evidence of their willingness adequately to perform other tasks uh, related to their to their positions, and you know I'd obviously think that uh, the relevant contractual uh, constraints would be would be uh, germane, and we'd have to talk about the specifics. But I wouldn't want to say in that kind of case if it's clear, for instance. Uh, that, uh, you know, somebody is inclined to be consistently unfair, perhaps even abusive uh, to uh, some subset of, uh, of students, for instance, in a class. Uh, that's certainly a reason to be, uh, you know, inclined to, to reassign that person and perhaps in some cases to terminate that person. Um, and I mean, their employment or actually terminate them? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm an administrator. I don't actually shoot people. I was I was thinking about about terminating employment. You know, abusive conduct in the classroom uh, certainly uh, might justify termination of employment. And uh, the point the point I take it is, uh, my speech might not just be in the classroom. It might be in some other context, and it might raise a question that you know whether I could in fact behave properly in the classroom. So you know we'd have to dive into the specifics and what evidence we had in a particular case. And I certainly wouldn't want to say we can automatically assume that you'll behave badly in the classroom because you wrote an op-ed that I might find uh, uh, deeply problematic, but I certainly wouldn't want to rule out uh, consideration of your out-of-class speech, for instance, as a, uh, a predicate for raising questions about whether you could behave with appropriate fairness, uh, you know, in your institutional role. So I, we'd have to talk more specifically about that. But anyway, so, but as a general matter, I don't want to see private institutions any more than public ones involved in, uh, in suppressing speech as such. I guess that's how I'd want to perhaps try to navigate that. Okay. Hey, um, in libertarian circles generally, and in left libertarian ones in particular, I think, you often find a hostility to religion. And you've written a fair bit about theology, so you don't seem to share that hostility to religion. So could you say a little bit about how you see that hostility to religion in, in libertarian circles generally, or left libertarian circles in particular, uh, and you know, how you see yourself as, as, as meeting it, and whether you've encountered, you know, sort of any hostility or pushback uh, from the kinds of things that you you work on in that area. Yeah. Um, 
you know, so the short answer to that last question is no. Uh, I really have not encountered any any hostility on the part of uh, on the part of libertarians or on the on that for that matter on the part of philosophers uh, to the uh, the work that I've done uh, in philosophy of religion and philosophical theology. Um, you know, I so I should say uh, just back to my own personal narrative. You know, I I grew up in a pretty conservative Protestant home. I say pretty conservative because uh, there were there were interesting wrinkles there. Some of which, uh, you know, maybe related to the particular um, dynamics of Seventh Day Adventist Protestantism, and some related to uh, uh, to my parents. So, uh, you know, Adventists as a general matter are uh, are Protestants in the in the Wesleyan tradition. Uh, and in many respects, pretty similar to to other uh, other Wesleyans. However, um, in significant part because of Adventist Sabbatarianism, um, Adventists came at least in the latter part of the nineteenth century to see themselves as current and potentially future targets for serious religious persecution, and thus became. Uh, active advocates of, of religious liberty. Um, also, uh, here I think, you know, we need to talk more about the, the relevant metaphysics and so forth, but I'm just describing the, the position. Um, Adventists have tended to be mortalists and materialists with respect to uh, uh, human persons. And for this reason, the typical Adventist view until fairly recently I think has been uh, pretty clearly a pro-choice view. Also important in that respect has been uh, uh, the fact that uh, Adventists have been deeply invested in healthcare. Uh, and so, you know, my dad, who was, as I say, a Goldwater Republican in general, uh, he might well have ended up a Trump Republican. Certainly, he was a, he was a protectionist, for instance, and opponent of, of immigration. But uh, you know, he was somebody who. Uh, always had at least a sort of mixed view of, for instance, folks on the Supreme Court, other conservatives might have, have disliked because he saw them as standing up for abortion rights and religious freedom, which were both things that he, that he favored. So it's a little complicated, but uh, um, in any event, um, you know, my, my own intellectual development, which involved uh, grappling with uh, uh, a lot of interesting uh, developments in uh, contemporary uh, Reformed Protestant thinking, uh, and Anglicanism, and Catholicism, um, you know, undoubtedly, uh, you know, widened my horizons as compared to to where I was when I was uh, when I was a kid, and uh, you know, I'm as a result of that, uh, you know, I'm certainly very appreciative of the. Uh, religious liberals and proponents of free thought who often lie at the uh, the foundation of uh, you know a lot of later developments in political liberalism and thus and thus libertarianism. I certainly don't view those people hostily, and I haven't tried to articulate my views in a way that would be that would be hostile to them. Um, it seems to me that uh, the uh, classical liberal and libertarian and left libertarian. Uh, skepticism, let's say, at minimum about uh, uh, about religion, uh, can often be uh, linked with a very understandable worry about the authoritarianism of religious institutions and the way in which religious beliefs are often propounded as uh, you know dogmas to be accepted, dogmata to be accepted, and. Uh, uh, you know, as uh, restraining uh, individual freedom. And uh, the perception very often is that, uh, uh, you know, say in a Western theistic context, uh, God is perceived as, you know, uh, very much like the, uh, very much like the state. And of course we have the Kuhn writing God and the state and suggesting that uh, the authority and uh, uh, so forth of one uh, is no more defensible than than that of the other. So I if think we need a god on stony throne to to quote my roommate. By all means, quote your roommate. Um, you know, so again, I've wanted to embrace a kind of uh, 
of position that's that's comfortably uh, uh, you know that. that you know, that's comfortably religious, uh, that's not uh, sort of hesitatingly or apologetically religious, but that also uh, takes very seriously the need for uh, critical thought and dialogue and doesn't uh, uh, present uh, a religious, uh, religious ideas as either sort of epistemically authoritarian, in epistemically authoritarian ways or as substantively, uh, you know, involving arbitrary uh, you know, arbitrary authority, uh, the imposition of arbitrary authority on people. Um, you know, that doesn't mean obviously that uh, the um, uh, stance of uh, people within within the movement uh, should just be uh, to blindly accept whatever I say. Uh, the nature of, uh, I think, uh, the kind of liberal culture I'd want to further is one in which there's, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, debate and dialogue. And even if I offer a, a more attractive uh, species of uh, of religious belief, uh, that may not work for people. My my dear friend uh, uh, Sheldon Richmond is uh, busily at work writing uh, an atheist blog. Uh, uh, this uh, this summer, and uh, you know, I don't uh, doubt for a second that uh, you know Sheldon uh, is unconvinced by some of the things I say. That's just fine. But uh, I think, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, I haven't experienced any kind of hostility in the movement, and I've tried to articulate an understanding of, uh, of religious belief that's at least responsive to the concerns that I think are uh, are certainly quite understandably there uh, in the movement with uh, hierarchical and authoritarian and anti-intellectual. Uh, styles of religion. Now, another uh, another position you often uh, find is the view that that the burden of proof uh, lies with the defender of religious belief to prove you know, prove the existence of God and that there's a presumption in favor of atheism. And in the analogy of love, you raise some doubts about that whole way of thinking about the burden of proof lying either on one side or on the other. Can you say a little bit about sort of the epistemological approach you have there. Yeah, so um, that's interesting. So my own uh, views about the epistemology of religion uh, reflect uh, to a significant extent the, the influence of, uh, of people like, uh, like Nick Walterstorff uh, and Alistair McIntyre, uh, I think in different ways, uh, also Bill, the late Bill Plaker. Um, and uh, I think the idea for all of them would be that we start where we are and uh, we acknowledge uh, uh, the uh, limited nature of our current understanding. We uh, are you know, open to and engaged in uh, dialogue with, with criticisms about our, our current position and we refine uh, where, we, uh, where we are kind of uh, you know, on the way in, in VIA. And uh, so that means that you know, epistemic justification. Uh, so while, while, while truth is, I think, not in any meaningful sense here relative, epistemic justification is, and it reflects the situations of, of particular people. So that I think the burden of proof uh, seems to me rests with someone who wants to uh, suggest that you should change your view, uh, whatever, the, whatever that view happens to be. And I don't, th I don't think we win points by beginning with some, uh, you know, substantive position uh, in favor of which there's, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the burden of proof always weighs uh, in a way that's uh, supportive of that particular substantive position. I think the reality is, you know, uh, to establish a burden of proof in a particular case, you've got to offer uh, offer reasons, and those reasons need uh, uh, to uh, to make sense to the person with whom you're in dialogue. When I uh, went on to read, uh, you know, your discussion in reason and value of uh, the kind of approach that you wanted to take, uh, as I note in a footnote that I, I think you must have already. Uh, stumbled on in, in the analogy of love. Oh, I looked up all the references to me in that book. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's what we do when we, when we find <laughs> uh, So yeah, I think uh, I, I, I really felt like what you were saying there seemed very much uh, uh, along, along similar lines. And I, I responded very positively that you weren't, of course, talking about these sorts of issues. But uh, it seems to me the general approach seems right to me uh, that uh, you know, uh, and you obviously are free to say, no, you've got me wrong, idiot. But, uh, you know, I think the, the idea is the burden of proof. You've got me right, but you're still an idiot. Can I say that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It would be rude, though. It would be, but that wouldn't be the first time. I'm, I'm hurt. It's possible. <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, I think I've, I think I've said enough uh, about that, that stuff to the point. Okay, on a different topic, one book of yours that I haven't read, but probably should, uh, given that, uh, you know, that you know, I'm involved in uh, a, a tiny, helpless nonprofit, is you have a, a co-authored book on Crushing the Begging Bowl, How Entrepreneurial Nonprofits Can Empower Themselves and Their Customers. Can you say a little bit about what that book is about and what you say in it? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, let's be very clear that my role uh, there doesn't give me credit for any, or at least almost any of the interesting ideas. Um, so this is a joint project of Dom Betro, who was for many years uh, the chief executive of uh, an entity that at least when I first became aware of it was the Family Service Association of Western Riverside County. I think it's a slightly different name now. Dom headed that organization for about 30 years. Uh, my dean, John Thomas, who was on the board of that organization for a couple of decades at least, uh, and uh, you know, and me, and uh, my role was primarily one of polishing prose and doing the layout and design. So uh, you know, I was definitely not uh, uh, not the uh, the key uh, intellectual inspiration there. But I would say that roughly what uh, what the three of us want to say. Uh, with ideas here uh, kind of inspired by Johnny and put in practice by Dom and, you know, at best sort of tweaked by me, is that uh, um, in various ways, nonprofit organizations with assets need to think about leveraging those assets uh, and uh, in ways that would make sense for for profit businesses need to be more open to risk need to be more open to profit making models as uh, uh, bases for for revenue generation um, the idea in any event is that crush you know the begging bowl uh, is a symbol of a certain kind of uh, monastic uh, approach to uh, to sustenance. Uh, the the monk is there with a bowl in hand, uh, asking others to uh, to contribute. Um, certainly, we are very much aware that part of what unavoidably goes on uh, with a nonprofit, um, part of what goes on with a nonprofit, certainly uh, is going to be uh, the solicitation of donations. But I think it's a matter of emphasis. Uh, the idea here is that. Uh, Ideally, idea ideally, uh, an effective nonprofit that has assets will be willing to leverage those assets, uh, uh, invest the results, use the uh, resources that it has uh, to uh, ground uh, for-profit activities that then can fund its not uh, not-for-profit. Uh, uh, undertakings, it's central undertakings. Uh, so be open to entrepreneurial thinking, uh, be open to using assets uh, creatively, um, be open to seeking profit, uh, even if you're fundamentally a nonprofit organization, and uh, perhaps more generally, be open to risk. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so switching gears for a minute. So you, you know, you spent uh, some time studying in, uh, in England. Uh, I did. So can you say a little bit about how that came about, how you decided to, you know, to throw your hat in that direction and what it was like uh, to study there? Yeah, so I finished an undergraduate degree in history and political science while taking uh, a fair amount of uh, coursework in philosophy and religion along the way and, you know, concluding um, early on that I wanted to do uh, that sort of thing uh, in graduate school. So uh, I applied initially to the institution that then was known as Claremont Graduate School and now is called Claremont Graduate University. And uh, I'm sure drove some people crazy there. I initially applied for, initially applied for admission to the Department of Government uh, planning to do political philosophy in that department. 
I uh, got tired of, uh, of that uh, and uh, I'd applied pretty early. And so I moved my application over to and was accepted by the Department of Philosophy. I very much wanted to do some work with the philosopher of religion, John Hick, who lived in that department, but was the chair of the Department of Religion in the graduate school. And uh, I um, wrote a letter, I remember, to the then chair of the philosophy department asking about uh, uh, kind of how I could draw on resources from other departments, and I think particularly the religion department, and got a rather, you know, pissy note back uh, suggesting that, yes, of course I could, but, you know, the, the implication, I think, was that I was you know, perhaps focused in the wrong place. So um, I just switched over at that point to the religion department. Um, and uh, I think that was all to the good uh, because um, John Hick, I think it was fair to say, was, you know, probably the, the leading English language philosopher of religion of his generation. Uh, and uh, the religion department at Claremont more generally was a very fi very fine department that included uh, you know people in a number of different disciplines, including both philosophical theology and biblical studies, who were who were really very very uh, impressive uh, at the international level. Um, a couple of years later, however, the National Research Council rated the Claremont PhD program number I think seventy one out of seventy one PhD programs in philosophy in. Uh, the, in the U.S. and so I think I, I probably dodged a bullet there. Uh, in any event, uh, so I uh, I spent some time working. Uh, I spent a some you know I started off the fall semester in 1987 working uh, with uh, with John, uh, who's a great guy and with whom I remain friends until his death a few years ago. Um, but I think I, for various reasons, um, decided I wanted. Um, something a bit different. And uh, I had the sense that uh, what I wanted could be, uh, uh, could be found uh, in the UK. And I applied to um, a bunch of graduate programs uh, in the UK, uh, I think to about six or seven probably. And uh, while, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, the uh, great dismay of you know all all sensible people associated with Oxford. I didn't get into Oxford. I did get into Cambridge, so I went to Cambridge. And uh, the uh, environment at Cambridge uh, was then, and I presume still is, great for multiple reasons. Right. So first of all. Uh, Cambridge is a very international place. You get the chance to meet people from all over the world. Uh, probably a third of graduate students, uh, it seems to me, are, are people from outside the UK. And so you really get an opportunity to, uh, to mix and mingle with, uh, uh, you know, with very intriguing people from, from across the planet. Uh, in addition, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, as uh, some viewers will know, operate uh, as uh, collegiate universities. They're made up of colleges which are not just, as is true in, I think, a number of the American institutions that have tried to copy them, uh, sort of residential units. Uh, but the uh, uh, colleges are also for undergraduates and maybe for some master's students uh, sites of instruction uh, as well. A and uh, so the colleges uh, then have uh, senior members attached to them who are, uh, um, you know, affiliated with a variety of academic departments across the university. And there are students for a variety of uh, academic uh, programs as well. How and so as a you apply there, do you apply to universities as a whole or do you apply to a specific college or, or what? Yeah, so when you're applying as a graduate student, at least when, when I applied, um, you applied to indicating you wanted to work in a particular academic department and maybe, I don't remember if you had to specify a particular supervisor, though that was certainly part of the process was making arrangements with the supervisor. But then you also specified four colleges that you wanted your application to be considered by. Now, I suppose in principle, um, you know, if you were accepted by the department, but not by any of the colleges, then, I, you know, I never had to discover what this was like, but I presume in that case you would, uh, uh, 
you'd probably not be bounced immediately. There would be some attempt to find you a college that you know might might be willing to accommodate you. But in any event, the value of the collegiate model, I think, was that you know, man, I got to know lots of graduate students who were in other academic disciplines, and so. Um, you know, they ranged from an astrophysicist called David Waymont, who articulated Waymont's law, all conversations ultimately come around to word processing, uh, which certainly seemed very apropos in, you know, 19, 1989, um, to, uh, you know, people this one just in, did. Well, exactly. And uh, uh, to uh, people in, uh, in philosophy, in international relations, uh, in law, and, uh, and so forth. And so I think in that sense, it was a very rich experience as well. Um, and so I, uh, and of course, as a PhD student, I'm not required to, uh, to do much of anything except write. So I went to seminars, uh, occasionally went to, uh, to undergrad lectures, but in particular, there were seminars that I went to in the philosophy of religion and theology within the Div School, or the, the Div School was a building within the Divinity Faculty. Um, and, uh, you know, otherwise I, I wrote away and I, uh, I had a number of other topics that initially interested me, but by early 1989, which means basically one term in, I had settled on a dissertation on the idea of friendship. And uh, uh, when people ask me what I, what I said about it, uh, I like to tell them that I I said friendship was a good thing and we ought to have more of it, uh, which seemed like a, an appropriate topic for a dissertation. But I, you know, I looked at, at friendship and uh, kind of the nature of friendship. Uh, what do we mean when we talk about friendship? What's friendship about? I looked at friendship and spirituality, friendship and ethics and friendship and politics. Um, what I had to say about politics was sort of proto-anarchistic uh, and it dismays me that I didn't think that through a bit more um, the idea was that, you know, uh, of course, in, in classical political theory, friendship is very important, but that makes a bit more sense in the world of Apollos, where there are uh, uh, very few uh, actual political actors, a limited number of free adult males. Um, and in mass society, uh, talk about links between friendship and politics might not seem to make much sense, but in a radically decentralized uh, political order with much smaller institutions, uh, that uh, the, the advantages of uh, that early, earlier set of arrangements might be recaptured. And I think even more so if you deterritorialize and, and so forth. In fact, I'm, uh, ironically, after 29 years, I'm um, going back finally and trying to turn that dissertation into a book. And I look forward to citing the uh, book that uh, Nathan Goodman reviewed that you called to my attention yesterday. So, uh, you know, couldn't have been more timely. Anyway, I, I, better, so, put a link, I better put a link into that. Yeah, there. please do that. Yeah, that was a great review by Nathan and the book, uh, book is uh, uh, certainly very, very on point. Um, so I, uh, anyway, I, I wrote the, the dissertation over the course of about three years, which was kind of the standard, uh, standard timeline for people. Um, and it was a dissertation that was, I suppose, roughly speaking, 50% theology, 40% philosophy, and 10% social science, something like that. Uh, friendship was the sort of topic that uh, made it easy to be, and what it was and is the sort of topic uh, uh, likely to make it easy for a dilettante like me to, uh, you know, spread out in all directions. So um, anyway, I, I wrote that dissertation and, uh, and um, defended it uh, in uh, September of 19, yeah, it was September 1991. And uh, so uh, I, uh, um, as is the nature of the case in, in UK academic programs, uh, those uh, evaluating the dissertation were not uh, people who had been previously involved. So I had a, you know, a dissertation advisor uh, who, uh, uh, Brian Hebblethwaite, who had uh, done philosophy at Oxford and theology at Cambridge and uh, was a perfectly good uh, person for that kind of, of thing from why I learned a great deal about that and other topics. Uh, but Brian was not part of the review process. Instead, uh, the, I had two examiners, uh, the philosophical theologian, Michael Banner, and uh, the philosopher Stephen Clark, who has since become uh, a friend, but who at the time was, you know, I suppose terrifying. Um, 
And uh, so in the nature of the case, um, they were precluded uh, by institutional policy from telling me what they were recommending at the end of the defense, which I presume they'd already settled on having read the dissertation before anyway. Um, and so I had to wait to find out for another six weeks or so uh, after that. Uh, and then uh, the degree was conferred in, in December of 91. Uh, and um, I'm not, you know, I, I worked on uh, turning the dissertation into a book over the next couple of years, and then I got distracted by various other things. And uh, actually, as it happens, just this week, I'm now uh, starting on the process of uh, trying to get it uh, finally into print. Uh, you know, you said, you know, being pro-friendship as though that would be uh, uncontroversial, but I just remember that in, in a recent, uh, in a, one of the recent videos here, I think it was episode nine, I think, uh, I, you know, I played a clip from Cyrano de Bergerac where he says, watching other people making friends everywhere as a dog makes friends, I mark the manner of these canine courtesies and think, here comes, thank heaven, another enemy. So, there's a, a text for you to consider. <laughs> I can consider that. Oh, my friends, there is no friend. Uh... Um... Uh, well, actually, on that note, uh, um, I often, when I remember, like to ask my, uh, I like to ask my interviewees about uh, works of art or literature, uh, books, movies, music, whatever, that they found particularly uh, you know, inspiring or engaging. They might have philosophical content or they might not. They just might be sort of things that that draw you, interest you. And so I thought we, we might finish up by talking uh, a bit about that. Um, I thought we were just getting started. I thought you had a... Uh... Oh, well, my, my meeting is yes, in an hour and a quarter. Yeah. Anyway, so... I'm happy to go on longer. I don't have a... Uh, I don't have a question. It's a pleasure uh, to talk. For a while later. So, uh, yeah, works of literature. Um, wow. You know, I love to read, I love to watch, uh, and uh, I think anything I, uh, anything I say is uh, likely to be inadequate and incomplete. Um, you know, my father's uh, mother's maiden name was Hood, and I grew up being assured by my father that we were somehow related to Robin Hood, and I certainly read a lot of uh, read a lot of Robin Hood as a kid. Um, uh, that's, that, that hardly counts as, uh, as profound literature, but I certainly enjoyed well, it. Well, it's, it's, it's an entree into left libertarianism. It is. I started out with uh, Roger Lancelin Green's uh, uh, collection of Robin Hood stories and certainly also read. Yeah, I read those too. Classic Howard Pyle version as well. Right, so um, right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of the thing, uh, things that have been hugely, so I'll tell you just things I've really liked, which doesn't mean necessarily that they were profoundly influential. Um, so uh, Lawrence Durrell's Alexandria Quartet, uh, I think is, is absolutely stunningly well written. Uh, when I was reading those books, uh, thanks to Sarvana Shebani in uh, the early, uh, early 90s, I guess it would have been 93, uh, when I started uh, started reading those books early '94, um, I was calling people up and making them listen to my oral interpretations of uh, things that Durrell said because I thought the writing was just so spine tinglingly excellent. Um, uh, another, uh, you know, I think uh, I haven't gotten around to reading those yet, but I've wanted to for a while. Uh, I'm told that that uh, the science fiction novel Ice Henge by Kim Stanley Robinson, whom you and I uh, met a few years ago, um, I'm told that at least the, you know, the, oh, there's a, the, the middle portion of that book is uh, like the Alexandria Quartet set on Mars. I don't know how accurate uh, okay. that is because I haven't read the Durrell and you haven't read Ice Henge probably, so, yeah. so we, we, we're, we're <laughs> We're not in a good epistemic position to judge that claim, but um, uh, but I do want to get around to reading the Durrell because yeah, I have I have heard them highly recommended by 
by many sensible people and you among them. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say by many sensible people and also by you. Um, yeah. Um, so I really, uh, uh, and here, of course, we're closer to philosophy, uh, have really enjoyed reading what, you know, almost all of Iris Murdoch's novels. Uh, I, um, I find her, uh, uh, you know, her writing, her, so the, the psychological characterization uh, that she uh, uh, so deftly engages in, uh, so forth, really, uh, uh, really delightful. And uh, I, uh, I commend her uh, very much. I mean, I think her, her philosophical work is interesting and important. I certainly learned from that. Uh, if that's for me, I'm not here. Um, but, uh, uh, but the novels, uh, I think are, are very rich and, uh, you know, typically for those who haven't read, uh, Murdoch's fiction, uh, she's somebody who I think really, uh, usually with a few exceptions, zeroes in on a small group of interconnected people and just kind of dissects their relationships and their motivations and, and so forth. And it's all very... It's all very interesting and, uh, and engaging. Um, one of her novels, I think it's one of her earliest, maybe her very earliest, Under the Net, which I enjoy, mm -hmm. although I confess I don't remember much about it now, but I always intended to get to more of them. Um, but Now, it is one of the earliest. I don't remember whether that comes first or whether Flight from the Enchanter, which is, I guess, a thinly veiled uh, a depiction of her relationship with, um, no, it's Elias Canetti. Oh, okay. Uh, um, who might well have pronounced his name Elias, I don't know. But uh, in any case... I, uh, I got a, a copy of that book as a birthday gift from a girlfriend in the 90s. But when we broke up, then I just didn't feel like reading the book. So I've still got it somewhere. <laughs> um, my, my personal favorite Murdochs, I think, are uh, A Fairly Honorable Defeat and uh, The Book and the Brotherhood. Um, uh, the book in the Brotherhood uh, begins uh, with the premise that uh, a bunch of uh, well-heeled uh, friends at Oxford have decided to create a syndicate, a syndicate to support um, uh, another friend, uh, not so well-heeled, because they're all convinced that he has in him a great work of left-wing political theory. And uh, so uh, they're going to support him while he produces the book. Um, and uh, uh, so, of course, I, you know, I mean, how could I not like the thought of, you know, being, being supported by a bunch of friends while I just write? Uh, I hope I'm a slightly less, you know, less unpleasant person than, uh, than that character is. But anyway, um, I, uh, uh, I heartily commend Murdoch. Um, you know, that's, that's on, the more, on the more highbrow side. Uh, I... Um, uh, I can also enthusiastically commend, well, I've just been reading uh, one of them, uh, the many books of Lindsay Davis, most of which are uh, quite witty mystery novels set in first century Rome. Uh, the, the first bunch uh, in the, uh, under the reign of Domitian, and, or sorry, sorry, the second bunch under the reign of Domitian, and uh, the first um, uh, under, uh, uh, Domitian's father. Why am I blanking on Domitian's father? Um, I'm reading too, and I've also read a bunch of those books. Um, oh, you've read Lindsay Davis. I did. I I hadn't yeah. realized. Yeah, you know, there's a while I was on a kick of reading both those and Stephen Saylor, who's. Oh yeah, uh -huh. yeah, I've read those too. Uh, yeah. novel set uh, a bit earlier during sort of the declining years of the, right. the uh, of the Republic. Um, um, uh, I, as as is the case with a number of. Um, of uh, series, book of detective series that I've read. I, at some point I lost track of which ones I'd read and which ones I hadn't. And so as, because my cop all I'd, you know, stored away in some box somewhere. And so I stopped reading the new ones because I couldn't remember which ones I had. But uh, that's also true of, have you, have you uh, ever read any of the works, the detective works by Donna Leon? Which yes, I've read a many of them. Prairie Venice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a big fan of those. I, I have a blog post about them somewhere. I but again, I, I read that. I'm not sure. Yeah. But again, I lost track of um, uh, I lost track of which ones I'd read and which ones I hadn't because I just I can't always tell from the names. 
And since I wanted to read them in order, because there is a kind of, just as with Sailor and, and Davis, there is a kind, you know, although they're more or less standalone, that they does make more sense if you read them in the, in the right order. Uh, I wanted to read them in the right order. So, yeah. but something so, goes up again. You know, though, though Donna Leone has specifically said that her characters don't age. Yeah, well, the, her, her, her main characters have, you know, they have a pair of, of teenage kids that, um, uh, that never get any older as the day pass. That's true. However, it's also true that sometimes a character who will be a suspect in one book will turn up as a trusted friend in another book. So if you read those in the wrong order, you already know, oh, I guess they didn't do it. So that's one reason to read them in the, in the right order. Yeah, fair enough. Um, no, I certainly commend those books. I, uh, I like those books. Um, I, um, and I also, uh, also am, am very fond, I think, about, about kind of series uh, of, of various sorts. Um, I'm a great fan of urban fantasy, and uh, I, uh, I want to commend uh, certainly the work of Stephen Brust, uh, Brust uh, who, uh, who writes urban fantasy set in an herb that's very much not in our world. Uh, but then also the urban fantasy of people like Jim Butcher, whose uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, Harry Dresden uh, novels, not to be confused with the, I think, dreadful TV series based on them, uh, are, uh, you know, really engaging uh, depictions of a, a wizard underworld in contemporary Chicago and uh, its environs. Uh, and the only thing I've read by Stephen Brust, I think, is, I think he's the one who wrote... Uh, to rain in hell, which is yes. that which is not really urban fantasy, unless unless heaven counts as uh, an herb, um, but it's you know it belongs to a genre you could sort of call you know theological fantasy, you know, fantasy involving angels and demons and and God and yeah, uh, and so uh, I, yeah, I actually I wrote him a fan letter about that that book when I was in college. Uh, and uh, wondered about its potential links with uh, my own religious tradition, and he responded in a long and thoughtful letter, uh, no, I read Milton. And, uh, yeah. Well, it does seem like kind of a, uh, you, know, a you know, a dark spin on, on uh, Paradise Lost. It yeah. also reminds me of the works of people like Neil Gaiman. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, how, if you ever read any Neil Gaiman? I actually haven't. I mean, of course I'm aware of him, but I haven't read his stuff. Yeah, he's because he has a number of work that sort of take place take place in um uh in uh you know in heaven or in hell or in some sort of commerce between them that uh have the kind of satirical but thoughtful uh you know edge that the Bruce book has. Yeah, and, and Burst has written a number of standalone books, but it's his uh, Vlad Toltos or Taltos uh, that uh, I think uh, uh, perhaps he's best known for. He's also got a book, and I'm forgetting the title now, that he co-authored with Emma Bull, um, a book that's a kind of, so it's set, um, it's set in, I think, in 1848. Uh, it concerns uh, uh, Chartism and uh, the uh, general uh, sort of political upheaval at the time. And uh, Engels is a character, and there's black magic. Uh, it, and it's a kind of faux Victorian novel. It has sort of the, you know, the structure of, uh, uh, and some of the characteristics of, uh, uh, of a kind of stereotypical novel of the period. Um, and it's got a name that's rather like that, but I keep wanting to say Loss and Gain, which was in fact the title of John Henry Newman's novel about Oxford in his student days. So I'm forgetting now what, uh, what their book is called, but I, will, I am gonna look that up because I think uh, for people interested in fantasy and politics, uh, it might be of some interest. So, you know, Brust is a Trotskyist, and uh, for those for whom that's a, that's a turnoff, be, be aware of that. I think he's a, you know, a good-natured Trotskyist, and uh, certainly uh, the uh, the book. Uh, Speaking of Trotskyism, have you read any of? Well, I'll I'll wait till you till you find the title of this before I ask my. my yeah, I'm looking for. Um, Our viewers will just be aware this is about 
two, you know, two guys whose memories are fading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's not loss and gain, it's freedom and necessity. Okay, well, it's X and Y. Uh, anyway, um, have you read any of Ken McLeod's science fiction? The embarrassing thing I have to say in response to that is, Obviously, uh, you know, Ken was nice enough to give us a blurb for, uh, for Markets Not Capitalism, and I've been aware of his stuff for ages, uh, but to, to my, uh, to my uh, discredit, I haven't actually read him. And he's someone for whom Trotskyism and libertarianism were both major intellectual influences. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, his, his, his first book, which is a four-volume series, the, the Fall Revolution, sort of... Uh, uh, draws on both in uh, interesting ways. He's, you know, he presents lots of different societies of sort of different flavors of capitalism and different flavors of anarchism and so forth. And uh, he plays fair in that none of them is exactly a utopia, uh, but none of, you know, none of them is actually, you know, at least most of them are not horrifically bad either. And he sort of presents you know, what's advantageous or disadvantageous about each of them. Um, I think in the introduction to the uh, uh, to uh, the you know, the later edition of the series, he says something like, "You know, my worry was, what was what if Marx was right about capitalism and Mises was right about socialism?" <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, you can see why he, he, you know, he'd be sort of sim simpatico with our left libertarian stuff. And I know Kevin Carson is a big fan of his. And, you know, Ken McLeod is not, not uh, you know, he's not sort of completely, you know, he's definitely not ideologically down with all the details of, of our particular uh, project. Right. He's, sort of, he's, he's broadly you know, sympathetic you know, uh, to many aspects of it. Yeah, three cheers, Ken. If you're if you're watching this, my failure to read your stuff is a deficiency on my part completely. Um, yeah, and then so so that's all all writing. Um, yeah, what have I what have I uh, you know what would I th think about in terms of uh, you know things I've I've watched that I that I particularly like. Um, you know, on the you know, on the more highbrow side, uh, one of my favorite movies that, you know, very few people seem to know. I don't remember whether you and I have talked about it before. So odds are you've seen it because you've seen everything. Is uh, the, what would it be, 91, 92, something like that, French film, Un Coeur en Hiver, A Heart in Winter. Um, um, absolutely exquisite film about, uh, you know, just kind of dissecting, again, dissecting relationships in a very, very low-key understated way. I think that's, a, that's just a, a brilliant piece of filmmaking. Um, I, uh, uh, I love Peter Bogdanovich's uh, The Last Picture Show, as also the, uh, uh, the novel on which it's based and the later novels that, uh, that follow that one. Um, uh, that's what I think of as, as sort of, yeah. Well, passing passing on from highbrow to not so highbrow. Um, I really love Kevin Smith's work, uh, which wonderfully I think combines highbrow and raunchy. Um, I uh, uh, I'm a huge fan, as as you know, Roderick of of Whit Stillman, uh, uh, who makes uh, little talky uh, kind of dramedies that uh, I think are. Uh, uh, yeah, just eminently, eminently watchable. Good luck and with couriérism. Good, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From his his first film, Metropolitan, which I saw thirty years ago this summer. Uh, I of that movie also. Uh, yeah. which was filmed on a very, you know, on a very low budget and a very yes. narrow time frame. It was taking place at Christmas time in New York, and they had to film as quickly as possible because, uh, you know, they had to finish it up before. The city took the Christmas decorations down because they were they weren't in charge of the decorations, and they were just they were just playing along with it. And so, and you know, and most of it just takes place inside you know, inside uh, uh, you know, rooms. And so, right? yeah. uh, it was successful enough that 
you know, the the next movie, Barcelona, could be rather more expansive in its in yes. its budget. And so you get uh, well, you get Barcelona, uh, which is pretty amazing to watch. Yeah, and then that's followed by the last days of disco, and uh, he uh, and uh, Stillman actually writes a novel uh, as a companion to that uh, to that film. Um, and uh, there's slight, there's some slight overlap, I think, uh, with at least one one character appealing appearing in that film very briefly, who's who's in the earlier one. Uh, and then of course he goes for a very long time without making anything, and then gives us uh, damsels in distress. Uh, yeah, um, yeah the, the damsels in distress is very charming, and of course features my you know. Uh, happily acknowledged celebrity crush Greta Gerwig, who I think is just does wonderful things. And of course, I'm so glad she's now making it as a as a writer and director as well as an actor. Um, and uh, then he, um, of course, finishes uh, that finishes off his oeuvre to date with you know he's always been fond of Jane Austen, and Jane Austen's work is clearly influential on his depiction of social mores and so forth in his earlier films. Yeah, and so we find that and Jane Austen is actually a major plot points since one of the main yeah. characters is a big Austin fan and is getting involved in a relationship with someone else who simply cannot see the point of Austin at all. There's a wonderful there's a wonderful bit in Metropolitan where he gives all these explanations to why he thinks Austin's no not a good writer and then he just admits along the way, Oh, I actually never actually read her, but I don't really need to read her in order to come up with a uh, you know a good analysis of, of her deficiencies. Uh, all the well, right, right. He has this I general view. Somewhat chastened on that point. Right. I mean, he has this general view that you know, why read the author when you can just read good literary criticism? Uh, and uh, so he's read Lionel Trilling on Austin, uh, but uh, but hasn't read Austin herself. And he says, you know, with with fiction, I can never forget it's all just made up by the author. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Little does he know that he's a fictional character made up by Witch Stillman. It would be that's. That's disturbing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and you know he's one of at least two people with significant roles in that film uh, who's never done any other acting. You know, I think the uh, I can't think of the name of that actor, but he's uh, uh, he's just gone on to be I think like a high school teacher in Canada uh, and uh, uh, very red haired guy. Very red haired. But the the other guy in that film uh, who. Uh, uh, you might know has never gone anywhere and with some regret is the uh, the resonant voiced guy that Tom and Charlie end up talking to in a bar toward the end of the oh, film. Yeah, talking about the ub. Uh, the, the, right. The, urban, uh, the decline of the urban haute bourgeoisie. Right. And uh, uh, he's uh, just not convinced by their analysis at all. And that guy, I think, was a, you know, was a lawyer or accountant uh, Stillman happened to know. And I remember in at least one commentary track I listened to, Stillman just observes that, you know, uh, people occasionally call him and say, how, where can we find this guy? How can we, uh, how can we place him in a film? Well, he's not an actor. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, yeah. Stillman, I mean, on the other hand, Stillman does tend to reuse a lot of the same, uh, um, as a stock company, <laughs> the same actors in, in somewhat different, playing sometimes similar, but not entirely similar. Uh, right. characters um, like Chris Egan who's just sort of delightful uh, yeah just a, a just sort of delightful to watch and listen to uh, yeah it makes makes those movies for me oh he's wonderful uh, but so what I was going to say when we got distracted was then Stillman does have this most recent film which is actually a Jane Austen film uh, mm -hmm. Lady Susan uh, and so he's taken this uh, I guess unfinished uh, Jane Austen text, uh, and uh, I guess this is the first time it's been it's been filmed, and he uh, uh, certainly translates it to film with his own, uh, you know, evident uh, sensibility very much intact, and uh, so I uh, I certainly commend that to. Yeah. Uh, no, I should see that. I, I didn't get into the last days of disco as much as into as mm -hmm. to, to Metropolitan and Barcelona. Um, but I, I'm kind of with you on that. I think I actually think Metropolitan uh, remains the best of his films, but I enjoy all of his stuff. So uh, you know, I certainly want to commend him. Uh, it's interesting. You might know he's, um, you know, of course, you know, has been such a chronicler in film of uh, 
you know, the, uh, the untitled American aristocracy, uh, which is probably not haute bourgeoisie actually, but anyway, um, but um, he is a, I'm trying to think of the exact connection, um, but there's, there is a family connection at any rate with E. Digby Baltzell, who uh, was, I think, a sociologist at the University of Pennsylvania, who was seen as the premier uh, academic chronicler of the preppy class. Uh, and uh, so it's perhaps not completely coincidental that he and, he and Stillman are connected. So, anyway. By the way, the emperor we were trying to think of earlier was Vespasian. Yes, good job. Thank you for... No, I didn't stop. I, did, I couldn't remember it despite, yeah, despite the fact that I'm supposed to be sort of a part-time classicist uh, and read lots of classical history and you know, couldn't think of the the guy's name. Yeah. You know, he was one of the less bad emperors. I mean, you know, he was a hard ass, but at least he wasn't a psycho crazy. Uh, and that's, that's always a point. That's a good, you know, a uh, good thing. I'm, I'm in favor of, of not, you know, people with lots of power not being psycho crazies. You know, I mean, I'd be all for overthrowing him and replacing him with nothing, but that's a... But that's a, yeah. Uh, for the given. Right. Um, you know, so this has all been movies. I guess we're going to talk about the th things that I've seen, uh, you know, on TV. And I, I do have to say, I pay more attention to TV than to movies these days. I think that uh, at least at its best, um, you know, good long arc television is... <laughs> Sorry, it's just unbeatable. Uh, I think the you've ability... got long arc television listed somewhere, some on some website or somewhere. You have you have that listed as one as one of your uh, one of your interests. I, yeah, I listed it in a, in a number of places uh, actually. Uh, you know, um, and it really is sort of a golden era for it because um, I remember I, I remember you know growing up in the seventies. It was there was um, uh, long arc television was very rare. Uh, you know. Uh, episodes tended to be one and done. There were some exceptions, but you know, apart from soap operas, which were generally not the you know not the highest uh, yeah. quality, um, uh, everything at the end of every episode just sort of reverted to the status quo, um, and because they you know, they didn't want people to you know because people would be viewing these things in broadcast and and they didn't have an opportunity to view them online which i think is one important reason for this they didn't want people to feel that that they'd missed something by missing an episode because then they might just think oh well, i'm not going to bother seeing the next episode and so forth so they want to make sure that you would be completely caught up with any episode you saw um well, and they, and they wanted to know they could offer things in syndication with the recognition that in syndication, they might not even be in the same order. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think we've really seen a, a dramatic shift there, just in the, the quality of television generally. I mean, it seems to me that, um, you know, uh, I would have thought at least that... Uh, um, you know, some of the shows on, you know, on the premium networks, things like uh, The Sopranos and Six Feet Under just managed to raise the bar for everybody else, uh, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, you know, so one of my uh, very, very favorite, probably in just if I had to pick one, my very favorite uh, uh, TV series remains Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which, you know, really kind of comes online a bit before that trend, but I think perhaps presages it uh, in, uh, in certainly featuring, you know, self-contained episodic plots, but at the same time, long arcs that are, that are evident uh, from the beginning. And uh, yeah, uh, just like before that, I mean, you know, in the 80s, you've got, you've got Hill Street Blues, yeah. uh, L.A. Law, and... Wise guy, which I was a yes, a fan of at the time. Um, uh, you know, so there were you know, there were some things like that. I, I didn't really watch L.A. Law, but I, but um, I watched oh. the blues when I, was in, uh, you know, when I was in college, along with you know some of the evening soaps like uh, Dallas and, and Falcon Crest. My roommates and I used to watch those. Um, but you know, it was, it was I was in grad school when Wise Guy. Uh, became, yeah. you know, it lasted all too briefly, but 
uh, I was a big fan of it at the time. Yeah, I remember remember uh, liking that. I yeah, it was I think it was on when I was in grad school, probably too, and so I was coming back and forth, um, and not catching it when it was in regular run, unless I happened to be back at you know in the states at the right time. I think the one piece of American TV that I managed to catch while I was in grad school in England on any consistent basis uh, was Thirty Something. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I remember watching. I remember watching some of that. Um, uh, you know, partly what interested me was that the you know, the main actor looked very much like a friend of mine, um, which is not a universally valid aesthetic principle, but it was sort of interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> watch, but I, I didn't get really uh, involved in it. Um, I think we should probably just, you know, begin to wrap things up just because, you know, my system's processing long videos is, you know, is, uh, is temperamental. And so the, the longer it gets, the, um, uh, the more it, it whines and complains and creaks and groans. And so we are uh, okay. almost at the two hour point and that is uh, you know, just about the limit of what it can handle. And um, uh, but I, um, uh, you know, that we can return to having another conversation like this at another time. Um, so. We should have had more fun talking about, um, you know, talking about uh, movies and TV than we did talking about philosophy. Uh, I don't know what that says about us and our our seriousness as philosophers. <laughs> um, <laughs> So maybe just so you know, it puts you less on the spot to sort of be defending your views and more just sort of talking about you know, stuff you like. Um, Though you could easily put me on the spot and demand that I defend my views of pop culture items. I could do. Yeah. I, I'm not encouraging you to do so. I'm just pointing out that uh, you're quite good at that. You uh, and I mean that quite seriously, Roderick. That your your work as a as a cultural critic of, of literature and of pop culture products um, always strikes me as as really uh, very careful and insightful. And uh, so uh, well, you're right about that. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Glad we can agree about that. All right. So um, if you want to turn off the recorder. Um, I can't stop you. That's true. God, I have this power. All right, then. I'm about to stop recording. Um, so uh, greetings to everyone out there. Um, well, the opposite of greetings, you know. Uh, you know uh, farewell. If you enjoyed this, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And see you all in a, uh, you know, well, or you'll see me. I won't see you, probably in a uh, future video. So au revoir.